Okay, guess what we're doing? <laughs> Back to Colossians, kind of, but not really. Okay? We're going to keep going and take, pick up where we left off last week. That verse out of Colossians, the blotting out of the handwriting of ordinances and nailing it to his cross. And I started last week with the burnt offerings because it made sense to me, and we're talking about the handwriting of ordinances is the complete law. I just decided to tackle the law of offerings, but if we were really going to, I mean, go to town, it could be the law of offerings, we could spend weeks as a little excurse on everything, shadows and types in the law of offerings that is Christ, Christ's work, we could go to the tabernacle and I could show how everything in the tabernacle points to Christ and Christ's work. So almost uniquely, it's, you can go overboard. You can kind of do this to the degree where you're seeing shadows and types in everything, which I don't want to do. But for us to understand how he blotted out, how he nailed to the cross, essentially when we talk about all things being in him, which the book of Colossians spoke about saying in him, all things are, and in him, all things are complete. So it's important to understand that all these things are or were in him as he took them to himself. But I'm also liking the fact that nestled in this Colossians, especially the area we're dealing with, we're seeing how if someone did not understand the things that are shadows and types, it'd be very easy to get confused about what are we holding on to? What are we still doing and what have we let go of? And then, as I said, inside the shadows and types, especially of the offerings, we find some truly amazing things that maybe help us not only to understand, to better understand the how of Colossians 2.14, but equally, I think, brings to life some of the offerings. So I'm taking you back to Leviticus. We looked at the burnt offering. That would be the first chapter of Leviticus. Today we're going to be looking at the meat offering. That is chapter 2 of Leviticus. And I said this last week. It's been said here. This should be ingrained in your mind. There are five offerings to God here. Burnt, the meat offering, which is either called meat, meal, or grain offering. The peace offering, sin, and then trespass. When God laid them out, God started with the burnt offering, the thing that's most precious and dear to him, and finishes with the trespass offering. When we come to God and we begin our approach, we don't start at the burnt offering. We start at the end, the sin and the trespass, and we work our way to the burnt offering if we ever get there. And this is where, I'm going to tell you, this is at some part of this message will be drifting in and out of the shadows and types to the reality of the offering, but also how it is applicable to us and how we should understand. Maybe there's an underlying message here we should take with us today of great import, I think. So let me start with, I'm going to read actually for the folks who are at home who may not have a Bible. That always is kind of helpful. I always think everybody's got a Bible, not so. So... And this may appear as very boring for some people. Most people, I've met people, I just skipped over the book of Leviticus, it's so boring. It's just instructions on how to, how to, how to. Oh, no, 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 no. Uh Uh-uh. And when any, any will offer a meat offering unto the Lord, his offering shall be a fine flour. He shall pour oil upon it and frankincense thereon. He shall bring it to Aaron's sons, the priest, and he shall take thereout his handful of the flour thereof and of the oil thereof with all the frankincense thereof. And the priest shall burn the memorial of it upon the altar to be an offering made by fire, a sweet savor unto the Lord. And the remnant of the meat offering shall be Aaron's and his sons. It is a thing most holy of the offerings of the Lord made by fire. Now here's where it gets interesting because this is going to all sound the same for a while, but it's not. It's like God saying, well, if you do this, then that. And if you do this, then that. So listen carefully to the subtle differences here. If thou bring an oblation, which is simply an offering, it's the same word. If you want to look back at verse 2, I mean, 
verse 1, where it says offering, this is the same word. Uh, King James didn't like to use the word offering twice. So if thou bring an oblation, which is simply an offering of a meat offering, bacon in the oven, it shall be unleavened cakes of fine flour mingled with oil or unleavened wafers anointed with oil. A lot of detail. And somebody might say, who cares? This is kind of stupid. Are we in a cooking class? <laughs> but if thy oblation be a meat offering, bacon in a pan or a griddle, shall be a fine flour, unleavened, mingled with oil. Notice every time, unleavened, unleavened, unleavened with oil. Thou shalt part it in pieces, pour oil thereon. It's a meat offering. If thy oblation, thy offering, be a meat offering, bacon in the fry pan. So we went from bacon in the oven, then we went to a griddle, now we're in a fry pan. Shall be made of fine flour with oil. Thou shalt bring the meat offering that is made of these things unto the Lord. And when it is presented unto the priest, he shall bring it unto the altar. And the priest shall take from the meat offering a memorial thereof and shall burn it upon the altar. It is an offering made by fire, a sweet savor unto the Lord. And that which is left of the meat offering shall be Aaron and his sons. It is the thing most holy of the offerings of the Lord made by fire. No meat offering which ye shall bring unto the Lord shall be made with leaven. For ye shall burn no leaven, nor any honey, in any offering of the Lord made by fire. As for the offering or, or oblation of the first fruits, ye shall offer them unto the Lord, but they shall not be burnt on the altar for a sweet savor. Every oblation or offering of thy meat offering shall, be, shall thou season with salt. Neither shall thou suffer the salt of the, of the covenant of thy God to be lacking from thy meat offerings. With all thine offerings thou shalt offer salt. If thou offer a meat offering of thy first fruit unto the Lord, thou shalt offer for the meat offering of thy first fruit green ears of corn dried by fire, even corn beaten of full ears, and thou shalt pour oil upon it, lay frankincense thereon. It is a meat offering. And the priest shall burn the memorial of it, part of the beaten corn thereof, part of the oil thereof, with all the frankincense thereof. It is an offering made by fire unto the Lord. So there is the meat offering. And you may hear me say meat, meal, or grain, or even cereal, because sometimes in talking, they're all, those are it's all English, so it's interchangeable for me. I'm going to try and stick with one or two terms, meat or meal, for the sake of continuity. But what is important here is to, to look at the distinction between the burnt offering, which, as I summed up, the burnt offering essentially is man's duty Godward, to God. So if the burnt offering is man's duty to God, and we can superimpose on top of that Romans 12, you are to present yourself a living sacrifice, uh, basically service unto the Lord. Here we have the burnt offering, a depiction first and foremost of the offering itself. Remember, I'm trying to look at shadows and types. So over the offering itself, that is Christ, who was wholly consumed. It's not as though in the theories of did he really die on, on the cross, he didn't swoon, he wasn't resuscitated he offered himself wholly and completely. He didn't say, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass. Nevertheless, I offer you my right hand only. All of him, okay? So the difference between these two is the burnt offering is wholly consumed. The meat offering, I should clarify this, the burnt offering wholly consumed by fire. The meat offering wholly consumed, but not all of it wholly consumed by fire. Does that make sense? Good. So I like to try and clarify sometimes when I think I've gone. Okay. So I've said to you last week, we see Christ here as offering, offerer, and priest. But there are other things that we see. The Apostle Paul speaks of Christ's death on the cross as a burnt offering. When he says Christ loved us, he gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice. But probably the clearest place in the New Testament, to make the connection, the correlation between what Christ did, who he was in that capacity as offering, is out of the book of Hebrews. I'd like to read that to you. You may turn there if you like. But Hebrews 10, beginning at about verse 5, says, Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifices and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. And that body, by the way, is 
the offering. So, in burnt offerings and sacrifices, verse 6, for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book, it is written of me to do thy will, O God. Above, when he said sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither hadst pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. By which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. And he goes on to talk about the priest offering, essentially, and goes on to say, But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for his sins, verse 12, forever sat down on the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. So you really do have in the New Testament a sense of connecting, not just when we talk about offerings, when we read about Paul talking about Christ, our Passover. Even James refers to Christ as a kind of first fruit. So it's kind of interesting to see if we look hard enough This is not a stretch. This is not some, oh, you know, I'm on some wavelength that's not part of the scriptures. No, this is really unfolding and, in my opinion, giving richness to not only the Leviticus portion, but to our text we're dealing with in Colossians to understand all this. So, as we move into the meat offering, let me just, I'll tell you a few things. The rabbis, in in Judaism, the rabbis considered the meat offering, to be the poor man's burnt offering. And the the greatest radical difference between these two offerings is, obviously, in the burnt offering, a life is being offered. In the meat offering, it is fruits from the ground. And when I use the word fruits from the ground, fruits and herbs, I'll clarify that in a minute, there is no lifeblood being spilt. There is your biggest difference. But the rabbis basically concluded this was the poor man's burnt offering. I'm, I'm not going to go there. Okay, I could in my mind say, yeah, that sounds right. But the only problem is when we go to analyze this, In, remember, you can't understand the Old Testament without the New and vice versa. When you begin to analyze this, you realize this couldn't just be another burnt offering. This has to, there has to be something more. So before we come to that conclusion, we'll do a little analyzing of the text. But Let me just say this. First, the first thing that we can know about this offering is like the burnt offering in what it may have had in similarity, it it was a a sweet savor as the burnt offering was. And as the burnt offering was, there is no thought of sin on the part of the offerer. It's simply an offering being brought. There isn't, it's not the sin and trespass offering. You're not coming here under penalty. That's why I said it's important to understand God starts first with the burnt and then the meat or meal, grain, cereal, whatever you want to call it, peace, and then to our condition. When we approach God, we start here. If we even take the steps, we start sin, trespass, peace, meal or meat, and then burnt offering. If we ever get there, and I say if because the bulk of the church world leaving the Old Testament behind and not doing the work that I have constantly said, be a Berean, you pick this apart, analyze, um, inwards, outwards, Greek, Hebrew, do all that you can. You begin to see the connections here are not just paper thin. They go through the whole scripture. So, important. First thing, sweet savor, but no sin is in mind for the offerer. Now, if we were going to compare between the offerings... For example, the sin offering wouldn't be a sweet savor unto the Lord. Okay, So we have to kind of put these together. Now, let me take a new page here. What we have in this offering specifically, we have flour. Somebody's going to tune in and say, oh, it's the cooking channel. <laughs> and let's see how we spell that, frankincense. I always mess this one up, frankincense. Flour, oil, frankincense. So as I said, the immediate thing we see between the first offering of the burnt offering and the meal or meat offering is I see no, I don't see a bullock, I don't see any prescription for life, I just see fruit of the ground. This becomes important for a reason, and you have to forgive me, but it's very difficult to explain this without turning there. So if you want to go with me to Genesis 1, wow, (laughs) 
It's uh, way back then. And I believe it's verse 29. Let's see. Yes. Now, in Genesis 129, God said to Adam, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of all earth and every tree which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. This is what I want you to really wrap your mind around. He says to you, it shall be for meat. So, if there is a distinction here, and I want to try and make this well put. This is a kind of a difficult, it's complicated. It's a complicated concept, so I'm going to try and simplify this. The fruit of the herb and of the tree was Adam's portion. Life always belonged to God. So when we begin to separate the offerings, we see something very distinct. In the burnt offering, a life is being offered. This is something that belongs to God, that's being rendered back to God, versus in the meat or meal offering, what's being offered are essentially the offerings that are the offerings of man or the portion of man. Does that make sense? I'm going to say that again because not all of you answered. And when I ask you this, please, it's important. I'm not trying to, I'm trying to figure out if, you, if you're following because if you're not, it's important. These become important pieces in understanding the offerings. So let me repeat real quickly. If Adam's portion was what came from the trees, the herb, the fruit thereof, and that's his portion. Everything else, the scripture confirms this. Everything that God has created, but specifically life, belongs to him. So in the burnt offering, the life that is rendered to God, that's an offering unto the Lord of what belongs to him. Now, that's not to say that the fruit of the ground and the herb of the ground doesn't belong to God. It all belongs to him. But what God apportioned to Adam is the fruit and the herb of the tree, which he said is for meat for him. So if you look at what's being offered, you can see the first offering, the burnt offering, is unto the Lord. This one has, by virtue of what's being offered, even though it's being offered, it's being brought to the priest, but it's really being offered unto the Lord, it actually tells you something about this offering. This offering is the duty of man to man. If the first one is man to God, this one is man to man in its value of offering. And I'm going to explain, because people might think, well, isn't that the peace offering? No. And we'll get to that just one thing at a time. If you want to understand this a bit better, you look at Cain and Abel's offering. Now, what it says there, and this is kind of interesting, because you just find it right at the beginning, and it's plain and simple. In the process of time, Genesis 4, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground and offering unto the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstling of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and his offering, but unto Cain and his offering he had not respect. Well, I want you to think of it. Now, we're talking in theological terms. I'm sure that God to Cain and Abel wasn't talking in these high technical theological terms. But catch the picture here. Cain offered, remember, the ground has been cursed. The curse has always already been given. Cain is basically offering back to God, not that there's anything inherently bad with this offering, but he's offering the offering that is the portion of man back to God, which is cursed, instead of offering to God God's portion, which would have been a life, which is exactly what Abel did. I've always said this. I've been saying this for years, that if one didn't even understand the portion that belongs to God, which is life, versus that which might be man's portion, this sideways offering, if you will, it would be very easy to say, well, God was just ornery, and he decided that day he didn't like it. No, he says he had no respect of his offering. So it's important to understand that with God, these subtleties actually matter. With God, it's in the details. He actually is looking for all of these. We, we read this and we say, but there was no law given. Well, there were some instructions that they had. There had to be a designated place where they offered, and there were instructions. We just don't have them. How's that? So how this comes down, if you see it right here, Cain's offering is frowned upon. Abel's is accepted. And what did Abel's offering have? Remember, they were not eating animals yet. Animal consumption 
We're not talking about God killing an animal to give them clothing either, but animal consumption only happened after the flood. So what we're looking at is essentially one coming to God and following what I would call the prescribed way that God said this do, and the other one, Cain, basically saying, well, why offer up the portion that belongs to him when I, I'd be really willing to give up this little paltry portion here that's not as prescribed. So there's a lot in here that brings you back to the offerings to make you kind of see how this correlates. We might look at the burnt offering as the yielding of a life to him, as I said, man's duty Godward, the meat offering, man fulfilling his duty to man. It's a, it, it is not a fellowship offering, but it is the duty to man. So had there only been, back to Leviticus now, if you want to turn back there, had there only been a burnt offering and not a meat offering, man would have lacked the satisfaction of his portion. This is, it's something wired in our DNA. We always want a part. And if you think about it, we typically, it's chronicled for us. We are so evil as humankind that we actually want to usurp God most of the time. That's what the Tower of Babel came about to be. And most of the things that were corrupted in caricature were an attempt to usurp God, even Lucifer himself. So we have to be mindful of this. After the law, the meat offering becomes an accompaniment to the burnt offering if you read the book of Numbers, and you'll see they're always kind of put together. I think the important thing there is that as things begin to change, you're going to see that inextricably tied, especially in the book of Numbers, if one has the conscience to have a duty Godward, inescapably, one would also have the conscience to his fellow man. And this, by the way, ties right into the Decalogue because half of it is God and man and the other half is man to man. So you can see you are, everywhere you turn, you are boxed in by this. It's not some random novel one-hit wonder over here. It's peppered through the scriptures. So what else can I tell you about this? Let's first start with the basic items that are in the offering. Let's talk about the flour. The picture here of grain or corn that has been pulverized to powder, the thought of bruising, testing, grieving, or being pressed upon. Because somebody might say, well, I could understand the bullock, a male in the burnt offering without blemish representing Christ, but how does this represent Christ? Well, here we have in type, if you will, you can't get flour unless something is pulverized, beaten down, ground, pressed upon. Basically, every type of treatment that you can put upon it. And specifically in this, there's another description which I'll get to in a moment, which is not just flour, but fine flour. So we'll talk about that in a minute. So the picture that came to me as I was thinking of this, this crushed, beaten flour, and I'm sorry, I can't, I can't be original. There's just only so much in the Bible here, and I'm going to go with the thing that just speaks right to me of what this flour looks like. This flower looks like, surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. He is the flower. If you want to take the flower and pour some water on it, which is the spirit of God, you get the bread, and he was called that in John, the bread of life. So it's important to see these symbols actually have a purpose and a place. How about, let's go to the fine portion. I didn't talk about this, the fine flour. That simply means there is no unevenness. There is no, there's nothing uh, that is unpure. There's nothing uneven or unstable. Now, I can say that many of the followers of Jesus were uneven and unstable. All you got to do is look at Peter or look at John, and you can see the instability and this kind of one day yes, one day no, but with Christ there is no. It's completely whole, perfect, holy. There is no changing in him. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, forever. So we have in this terminology fine flour, not just ground, powdered, beaten, pulverized, but with no blemish perfect. Of the oil, that should speak for anyone who has studied the scriptures. 
should be self-evident as representational of the Holy Spirit. Now, back there in the burnt offering, we didn't have a mention of oil. We had a mention of water. There, same thing, the water is representational of the Spirit. Here, we have it being represented with oil, the oil of anointing. But what's interesting is this broken bread, that is, or this crushed flour, if you want to call it that, and then the oil goes on top of it. All I, I keep thinking about, it's almost like when I'm talking to you, there are so many scriptures that just rush in of thinking of Jesus when he was being baptized and then how we see the Spirit descending on him. Here is the oil essentially being poured up upon him publicly that all could behold. So we've got this concept there. And then ultimately, last but not least, we have frankincense, which, as you know, at the birth of Christ, we had those... They were not three wise men, as people suppose, but there were three gifts, frankincense, myrrh, and gold. We have here frankincense, which is a reoccurring theme. Interestingly enough, frankincense does not have a strong perfume or aroma until it is put to the fire, and then and there the sweetness of its odor is released. Which brings me, I have to go back to Leviticus, which brings me to why... The reference, and I'll repeat this, uh, I'm not done, but I'll repeat this again, why there is a stipulation here. For example, the, the frankincense is, as I said, can be burned. But there is a mention here where it says, No meat offering, verse 11, 2, 11, which ye shall bring unto the Lord shall be made with leaven. Leaven is always the symbol of unclean or of sin. Remember in the New Testament, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, beware of the leaven of the Sadducees, or beware of the leaven of Herod. So no leaven. Remember all these unleaven, unleaven, unleaven. For ye shall burn no leaven, nor any honey. Now the honey, that makes perfect sense, because honey put to fire spoils. It goes rancid or putrid. And if you want to kind of extrapolate from that on the other side, why in verse 13 it says, every oblation or every offering of thy meat offering shall thou season with salt. Salt is the preserver. So you have one that has the capacity when it comes in contact with heat to to putrefy and spoil. This is why he says no leaven, no leaven, no honey, but salt, which is always the preserver So it's kind of interesting. If you look at all the things in here, you you go to the New Testament where it says you are salt of the earth. You know, I think a lot of people don't even realize that concept is preserving. We We are those who have been called by God. We are the preservers, if you will, when we spread the words of life of Jesus Christ. We we indeed become that salt. So now you might say, well, what part of this offering am I? Well, right now you're nothing, okay? (laughs) Just wanted to say that. (laughs) Felt good. Okay, hold that thought for a second. So, we know salt preserves and it prevents corruption, while leaven, the sour dough, if you will, is usually used to denote corruption. So, this offering is supposed to be made we'll call it in in sincerity. We have that in the New Testament when it says, let your offerings be made uh, with sincerity, not with the leaven. It's it's crucial to understand all of these instructions. If you're just looking at it and you're looking at them as food items, they speak nothing. But if we compare, for example, the burnt offering and the meat offering, or if we compare the meat offering to the sin offering, we, we begin to see the differences. We begin to see, for example, how as I referenced earlier, that the the meat offering was not wholly burnt, but wholly consumed. Here, in the meat offering, I have now kind of tried to explain how we have this. It's not fellowship, but it is man's duty to man. And the burnt offering is man Godward. So, These are the two ways of kind of distinguishing between the two. And then something more. See, it says here, if you read carefully, it's an offering unto the Lord, but the priests, the priests shall take from the meat thereof a memorial, shall burn it, but there is a portion that will go to the priests to be consumed. And 
Now, here's where it kind of gets interesting, where you can kind of drift in and out of the types. If it is for the priest to be consumed, I no longer want you to think along the same wavelength as I've been talking, but the priests translate for us in the New Testament as all of us. We're all partakers. We are, we are a royal priesthood. So when we talk about the priest partaking, we actually get to partake of that. But let me say something on that. If you really look at what happens with the burnt offering and the meat offering, everything is consumed. Now, in the, in the burnt offering, God gets it all. There may be some parts left over. I'm, I'm not going to get into the minutia of that. In the meat offering, it's wholly consumed to whatever degree it's distributed. It's wholly consumed. There's nothing left. So I could stand here and say, in the burnt offering, now bring this back to us now. In the burnt offering and in the meat offering, what's left for the believer? Nothing. I just said, but we're priests and we feed on this. Yes, but if the expectation is that something should remain, you and I have not yielded ourselves to God. That, my friends, is the problem with the bulk of the church. See, we don't talk like this anymore. If you listen to sermons and messages from maybe early 1900, old-timey stuff where people could still talk about sin and repenting and people didn't go, oh, God, that? What's that? I'm not too guilty. I haven't done anything bad. But if you look back on that time, there's definitely, I'm not going to say in every message, but in those who were preaching the gospel, there was definitely this understanding. We weren't coming into the church of Jesus Christ to receive anything but salvation, to receive anything but forgiveness of sins, to receive anything but the promise of eternal life, which take that now into the age and decade we live in where people only want to come into the church asking, well, what else is God going to do for me? What else am I going to get? What am I going to... Like a bunch of petulant children thinking that all there is is just gimme, 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 and there isn't any time to really contemplate. What have I really sacrificed and given to God? What have I really let go of? And if you look in your heart, I'm not going to say all of us, but some of us cannot answer that question openly or truthfully because it would be blatantly clear that we have not yielded ourselves, that we have not come to that place. We're still in the give me, I want, I need, like a child, like a baby that only has wants and needs, or as it's been said here, like has been described as a drawing, as a flathead, right, with wants and needs. That's how it was described here. So it's important to understand that these offerings, they symbolize, they show us. I, I'm, I'm trying to show you when we say how it was nailed to the cross, how the handwriting of ordinances were, were fulfilled. Well, if all these things typify him and our relationship, God to man and man to man, then there is no issue for me if I'm in Christ, then I am in his, it's going to sound weird, but if I'm in Christ, I am in his accomplishments. I am faithing in his finished work, and therefore I'm no longer looking for give me and what can I get, but rather, my God, what have I received already? I've said, if God never did another thing for me, the very fact that he deigned to condescend to take me, little old me, and I'm not going to paint myself as Mother Teresa, I've said that's kind of like, it still boggles my mind. The, all these years later, and I still say, like the song, why me, Lord? But hey, I'm not asking you to take your hand off or anything. I'm just saying, wow, because I realize that I came into this world as an absolute destitute pauper, and that's the way I'm going to go out unless I am in Christ, faithing and trusting in him. In that case, I go out with the riches of Christ, which are inexhaustible, un incomprehensible, and beyond the human realm. We never tap into that. We spend most of our time with the handout. So these offerings teach me that, Something more, there's, there's, there's more here to kind of mull around. If you keep reading, it's going to get to the offering, verse 14, and if thou offer a meat offering of thy first fruits unto the Lord. And then it says, thou shalt offer for the meat offering of thy first fruits green ears of corn, dried by fire, even corn beaten out of full ears. Thou shalt, here comes, there it is again, thou shalt put oil upon it, Lay frankincense thereon. It's a meat offering. The priest shall burn the memorial thereof. Now, this is what's interesting. 
part of the beaten corn thereof, part of the oil thereof, with all the frankincense thereof. It is an offering made by fire unto the Lord. So this is a little bit different. And to understand this part, you've got to turn to Leviticus 23. Sorry, it's, these are the ways that we learn scripture and understand. You've got to move around a little bit for those people who are, just can't turn the page, right? Okay, get, get over it. Okay, thank you. So, I just, we just read through flour, oil, corn, meal, meat, and reading that in a cursory reading, just say, okay, well, it's another day at the tabernacle. There was just a bunch of flour and oil and frankincense. Nothing else here to see, folks. Move on. Or as I've showed you, there's a lot more to see, and there's a lot more to pick apart and kind of wrap your mind around. So in Leviticus 23, beginning at verse 4, these are the feasts of the Lord, even holy convocations, which ye shall proclaim in their seasons. In the 14th day of the first month at even is the Lord's Passover. See, he starts with the Passover. And then the 15th day, the same month, is the Feast of Unleavened Bread unto the Lord. Seven days ye must eat unleavened bread. The first day ye shall have an holy convocation. Ye shall do no servile work therein. But ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord seven days. And the seventh day is a holy convocation. Ye shall do no servile work therein. And the Lord spake to Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, when ye come into the land which I give unto you, ye shall reap the harvest thereof. There ye shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. He shall wave the sheaf before you to be accepted for you. On the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. And ye shall offer that day when ye shall wave, when, when ye wave the sheaf of a he lamb without blemish of the first year for a burnt offering unto the Lord, and the meat offering thereof, they are back to back right here, shall be two tenth deals of fine flour mingled with oil, and an offering made by fire unto the Lord for a sweet savor, and the drink offering thereof shall be of wine, the fourth part of an hin. Keep reading. Ye shall eat neither bread, nor parched corn, nor green ears, until the self same day that you have brought an offering unto your God, it shall be a statute forever throughout. So essentially, God first, you second. You know anybody, I'm not talking about the folks who've been taught here. You know anybody that thinks that way, God first, you second? I don't. And yet if I went out into the street and said, God first, you second, people would say, yeah, right. That's what it says right here. In fact, that's what it says in every, and I'm going to say it in every damn book. Of the Bible, God first, you second. God first, me second. But in this me first generation, no one wants to hear that. So it's kind of, but not really. And that's what I call disingenuous worship or disingenuous worshipers. You might say, well, that's pretty harsh. Well, listen, haven't I been saying and hasn't it been said here for so long? If you're going to be a Christian, be one. Don't fake it. Don't try to walk and act and do like the cookie cutter that people believe. Oh, that, that's a Christian. When you walk like that, when you talk like that, no, when you walk in the power of God's spirit, trusting Christ, it's very simple. And you find out that maybe the authentic Christianity that most people actually really are craving for, they can't find because no one's telling them, get off of yourself. Turn your eyes. We sing a song, turn your eyes unto Jesus. That's the first place. You will find yourself when you have figured out there's somebody greater and more important than you who's got your best interest at heart, looking out for you. Okay, sidebar. You shall count unto you from the morrow, I can't help it, after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. Even unto the morrow, after the seventh Sabbath, you shall number 50 days, and you shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. And there's it, it's ongoing instructions here for the offering. If you keep going, you could read through the whole thing. But it basically gives you a whole lineup of the feasts. And why is this important? Because they are not all, if you read carefully, you've got, for example, you'll have a sheaf of the first. It's, it basically breaks down in every category. And this becomes important because the first fruits are not being offered 
like other offerings within the meat offering. They're being offered differently. And I go back, turn back to where I was, and read once more. If thou offer a meat offering of thy first fruit unto the Lord, thou shalt offer for the meat offering of thy first fruit green ears. So he's giving a specific thing, green ears of corn dried by fire beaten of full ears, and thou shalt put the oil, lay the frankincense, and it's a meat offering. And then it says, part of it beaten, part of it, part of the oil, part of the corn, all the frankincense. So what we are to understand here, again, here's another type you've got to move with. If Christ is indeed the first goer and the first fruit of our faith, there cannot be any leaven attached to a first fruit offering. There cannot be anything that spoils. So you see, when I come back to this, you wrap all these types up, and I could keep going because there's a lot more. I just don't want you to walk away going, ah, she just kind of dumped a whole bunch of stuff on me, and I can't seem to dig out of what she dumped. But that may be the case right now anyway. But I'm just saying to you that the main thing that is a takeaway here is the typical application of all of these types. And if we're applying them properly we begin to see that if indeed, for example, Christ is the flower, Christ is the oil, Christ is the frankincense, all of these things, and it is the depiction of man to man, God's man's service to man, then we begin to understand that these offerings, for example, this second meat offering, cannot be considered as the rabbis consider it as the burnt offering for the poor man. Its distinctions, as I've just shown you, are far away to be compatible in that same mindset. Now, although there is, as I said, no sin in the mind of the offerer, what we are seeing, and I'm using, I'm going to use this term, but do not call this a fellowship offering. But if I'm going to use this term, it is, it typifies, as I said, the two tables of the Decalogue, the one part which is God to man, the one that is man to man, it typifies our service to our fellow man. And I'm using the word fellowship right now, but please don't label this as such. So, in the types, as we move through this, we see some things that, in their order even, make sense. As Christ was the burnt offering, wholly offered up to God, he makes possible. You could not have the meat offering before the burnt offering if you were going to look at it still in type because Christ, who is the burnt offering, wholly offering himself up, had to do what he did before we could come to the mindset of the meat offering, which is offering in fellow man, man-to-man concept. We couldn't do that without Christ first doing what he did. So even the order of the offerings makes sense. Now, if you're still kind of looking at this and saying, okay, you've described all this, and you go back to the discussions we've been having out of Colossians, how it says blotting out the handwriting of ordinances. Well, these were ordinances. These were mandates. And although these, the first three at least, are voluntary free will, they were still part of a prescription that God gave that said basically to fallen man, this is the way of approach. And if you want to approach me, this is how you're going to do it. And failure to listen to God was essentially God basically saying, you cannot be in fellowship with me. Failure to comply. So, to take all of this legal stuff and see it more on the plane of Christ, we see Christ in all these things, makes it easiest, easier for us to see how when he went to the cross and died the death that he did and rose up again on the third day and is coming back, when all that happened, it's easy to see how God could put it essentially in him and on him so that, as the scripture says, we could pass out from underneath it. So those folks who are still living in the dispensation of trying to make the law applicable today have not yet understood all that I've just explained in the last, say, 30 or 40 minutes. This is why when people say, well, but, you know, the church, we're never together, the whole body. I'm I'm not talking about faith center. I'm talking about all churches, all of the Christian faith. Why? Because some people would read this and say, well, I I don't want to bother talking about offerings. I don't want to waste time talking about these things. And I could stand here and tell you, I could not only deliver the messages I just did of shadows and types, but I could also show you 
which I said last week, which I'm going to do right now because the door is open for me. I'm going to show you how most people, if they ever think of these offerings as offerings that one can actually make, what we're going to call them in practice, all right? There are very few people who would be willing to give an offering in the way of a burnt offering. In other words, I place it all there, I watch it go up in smoke, and the consequences of that thing burning and being wholly consumed do not face me, they do not concern me, for I have done my part of what the Lord has called me to do. Most people come wanting to substitute the burnt offering for a meat offering, something that's of lesser value, that's of our portion, not God's. And the mindset is essentially, if you think about it, that works flesh mind sh- mindset. It's more important for my fellow man to see me and acknowledge what I'm doing than it is to do something in secret, according to Matthew 6, that only God sees. Any takers for that? Yeah. Okay. What I'm going to say then is, because I, I'm, I think I'm, I'm done explaining my shadows and types, and I think any more would kind of like be beating a dead horse. So now let me, let me take the rest of the time to talk about how, in my mind, we have more people bringing leaven. You're not going to like what I'm going to say, by the way, so don't think it's going to be something you're going to feel good about. I'm not talking to you, though. I'm speaking in general. Most people will bring leaven with their offering. And do you know why? Because in their mind, I'm not saying this to be cruel. I'm saying this to be truthful. In their mind, they have not yet understood a concept. You know, when we talk about giving here, and I've taught on this for years, giving with no strings attached, over the years where I've tried to tell people, when you give and you are giving and putting in God's storehouse, wherever that storehouse is, whether it's Faith Center or some other church, wherever that is, you are not doing God a favor, nor are you doing something for your fellow man. You are doing something that when God said, if we're going to use these types, you are doing of your own free will, of your own volition. There's been no coercion, but you're doing it as a worshiper. Most people think their sin and trespass offerings are worship unto the Lord. No, they're not. Do you see what I'm trying to explain? Is that how we understand all of this also affects how we understand giving and finances in the church. Failure to understand and separate these offerings and rightly understand them and rightly divide them, you'll have people all the day long wanting, wanting to offer up a sin or trespass offering, trying to make you believe or God believe that it's worshipful. No, that's your duty. Now, I put, and I'll get to the sin and trespass, but I put the sin and trespass offerings in a different compartment completely. But that's what happens by and large. So the reason why we have people who have never been taught giving and can't get the concept. Now, I live a certain lifestyle, and I try to live by that lifestyle. I don't tell you. I don't say do as I do, but I'm telling you how I see things. I have participated in, um, for this ministry and various other things, We'll call it benevolent works. And guess what? It's nobody's damn business. And the very fact that you feel the need to tell somebody else the the deed that you've done basically negates what you've done. Matthew 6 says, when you give, when you do your alms, when you give, you do it in secret. You don't go and tell people. You don't try and get, oh, look at I I gave this, and now I want to be recognized for it. All of this ties into that. The attitude in which we approach God the way we give. You'd think, by the way, most churches are just interested in just send your money, write a check, digitally donate, whatever you do, not interested in taking the time to make it plain and understood that there is a way of approach to God, even in a New Testament mindset. The New Testament givers, they brought everything they had and placed it at the feet of the apostles there in that first century church. Now, in today's day and age, we don't live by that. They were a koinonia community. They basically distributed amongst themselves. But giving, for some reason, now, we don't, we don't have these large discussions, but giving had to be at the core of the New Testament church for it not only to survive, but to take care of its outreach. Paul says they are to do this once a week, 
this offering should be taken to Jerusalem. Some of it was given to the poor. Some of it was for communities, for establishing and setting up at the time what were churches in homes or in synagogues, not yet churches as we know them, structures specifically designed for worship. But in this day and age, people still come into the church if they even have a mind to give, if they even have a mind to read, to study, to understand, and they basically bring that leaven mindset with them, which I've called the lint offering. Give a little pocket change, put it in the offering. No thought of why you're doing it. No thought of, really, is this how, if God, if God himself was standing in front of you, would you reach into your pocket and pull out those three pennies with that lint and say, that's what I'm putting in the offering? I don't think so. If God actually appeared in front of you, I think you and I would probably do the same motion. We'd probably fall flat on our faces and not deign even look up. But you surely would not insult God by giving him a piece of dust out of your pocket. And I think that's, that is what we have become. The church world today, for its lack of respect and honor for God, for its lack of studying the word, yeah, I've completely departed my message because this one probably is the, the one the shadows and types are needed, but this one actually goes to the core and cuts to the quick for most people. Do you know why? I can talk about salvation all day long and you'll have people sitting at home going, yeah, she's a good preacher. Yeah, keep, keep talking. But the minute I talk to you about God's way, God's way of approach, how God says this do, You know, the people, I've told you this before, the people who are chronic in their abuse of scripture to either raise money, like somehow we're we're at some carnival and no blatant disregard for this, or the very same people who are reading the scriptures who will take something in there and say, well, I'll do a part of this. Now, we're no longer under the law. We are free in Christ. You are free to do whatever the heck you want, and so am I. I choose. I have chosen. And I've chosen to look at this book and say, I'm going to try and order my life according to this. means I'm not living under the law, but if I understand all this, I can also understand the magnitude of what Christ did for me. Because had Christ not done that, you and I, we'd still be living under the same sentence of death, Some of my Jewish friends, when we have these conversations, it always goes wrong because I say, how does your Bible end? It ends with Malachi, with a curse. It doesn't end with good news. It doesn't end with, hey, it tells me that when Malachi was penned, that's the last book of the Hebrew Testament, when Malachi was penned, the priests were basically stealing from the church or the synagogue or the temple. The priests were offering defective offerings unto the Lord. The priests were doing, they were not doing their job. They had blatant disregard. So if it starts with the priests and they don't care, who's going to follow that? Who's going to look at that and say, oh, the travesty of it all? No, it just, it degenerates even more. So as the, New, as the Old Testament's closing, you see how not only the priests have degenerated, you remember in Ezekiel how the presence of God is moving away? So we can know something. God basically, he had Christ in mind from the beginning, but that he came to us after he was rejected from his own, that he came to us and gave us that opportunity. Anybody who wants to call themselves a Christian should be looking at the whole book, 66 books, the whole book, the stuff that you go, cuss, dry, it's boring, it sounds like a cooking show, and do what I just did today. Reach in, dig a little bit, and you'll find something. You'll find that the information given in a book that's just a prescription of how to offer gives me great depth and insight into the finished and completed work of Christ. That he and he alone as priest, I go back to my, I told you I go in and out of these things, he as priest and he alone now makes intercession for me and for you seated at the right hand of the Father. Now, if I could somehow tell somebody out there, and it's always, this is always the difficult part, you can't see him, you can't feel him, and the only way you can get to know him is through that book or through someone who has some integrity to preach the book to you. 
And then the rest of it becomes homework on your part. It's not all for me to do, it's for you also. Your part is the faithing component. Your part is to say, I'll take this, I'll meditate, I'll think about what she said or what this scripture says, and then I'll apply it to my heart. It doesn't mean that I can put it into practice. Hear what I'm saying. It doesn't mean I can put it into practice. There's many things in this book that when I first read them, I could not even begin. But as I have grown, and I keep growing, and I'm not done growing, but as I keep growing, I recognize I can't, but God can. I can't do it on my own. God never designed that and made that way for me. But if I'm trusting him, I can see him in these things. I can better understand that if one offering is strictly for him, and this offering is, we'll call it as I've used the term fellowship, but not really, then the rest of the offerings are going to reveal something more. Remember, I've just touched on the two important things, right? Man to God and man to man. So what do these three other offerings do? And where is Christ in all of these? To find that out, you've got to come back next week to be continued. That's my message. I'm Pastor Melissa Scott, pastor of Faith Center, Glendale, California. I teach every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. If you'd like to attend services with us, simply call the 800 number, that is 800-338-3030, to join us. If you'd like to watch, listen, and learn 24 hours a day, simply log on to our website at www.pastormelissascott.com.